Hi everyone, it's Beth Kukenberger, and this is the holiest of weeks. This is the week that changed absolutely everything. This is the week that allows us to dream the other days of the year about stories of reconciliation and restoration and redemption and rescue and repair. This is the week that the Lord wrote with incredible intentionality all the way from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday. Every detail of this week is rich with meaning. And his story started, of course, before the beginning of time. But go with me back to Genesis chapter 15. When God was talking to Abraham about, he has two promises for him. He's going to give him as many descendants as stars in the sky and the land in which they're going to dwell. And then to offer faith to Abraham, he agreed to seal that covenant with a blood path covenant, something that would have been very familiar to Abraham at the time. He directed Abraham to get some animals, cut them apart except for the birds, pull them apart so there was a bloody middle between the two of them. What was happening in that culture is when two people covenanted over all kinds of things, they would walk through that bloody, that blood path, signaling to each other and everyone watching, if I break my end of the deal, I'll pay the price with my blood. When the Lord directed Abraham to do that, he knew that he would keep his end of the bargain perfectly but he knew that Abraham and his descendants couldn't keep a perfect covenant with a perfect God. So he put him to sleep and walked through that blood path covenant on behalf of himself and on behalf of Abraham and his descendants, of which we are. Because Abraham couldn't keep his end of the deal, because he couldn't have a perfect covenant with a perfect God, somebody was going to have to pay the price with blood. And that brings us to this covenant week that we're in right now. Ever since they made that, that promise to each other, they've been, they've been remembering that between Abraham and God by taking the blood of that day sacrificed animal and splashing it on the altar at, at 9 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock in the afternoon and blowing a shofar when they did it and everyone remembering about that promise they made with a perfect God. If you come to this holiest of weeks on that crucifixion Friday, if you read your Bible about how the Jewish day starts the night before and add up all the hours. Jesus was nailed to the cross at nine o'clock in the morning and he hung on the cross for six hours until that second shofar of the day blew because we have a God who's always literally perfectly on time, who's been writing a story for a very long time and we can trust him with the details in it. Like think about the Last Supper. The Last Supper, the night before Jesus was crucified, the year the Lord died, it fell on the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. That was bread without leaven. Leaven represented sin. And they would have this, this, this feast to remember that coming one day is going to be one without sin. And the head of the household would rip the corner of the bread off. That was called the afikomen. And he would hide that because they were remembering that coming is the day once when there'll be someone without sin. But right now he's hidden from our sight. We can't see him. And after the end of the meal, if there were any children at the table, they were tasked with looking for the hidden afikomen. If there were no children at the table, then the head of the household would bring that back out. He would rip it in little pieces and he'd give a little piece of bread to everybody at the table, which that looks like communion to us today, but that had been going on a long time before Jesus. So then if you imagine that scene of that supper and the Lord is there with his disciples, he holds up the bread without sin and he rips off the corner of it and he holds it up and he says, this is my body broken for you. Now when you do this, you do it in remembrance of me because I'm, I'm the one long hidden. I am the one without sin. I am the one who has come for you. And he resurrected on Sunday with these messages of, I've conquered all sin and all death. There is nothing I can't do. The first person he showed himself to was Mary Magdalene. All four accounts illustrate that. And who's Mary Magdalene? She's someone who had been freed from seven demons in her past. It's like the Lord is announcing to all of us that read those passages. I don't care where you've come from. I don't care where I've had to free you. You, can, you are never going to be disqualified from carrying my good news. She is the first person to declare the risen Christ. And she goes and tells those disciples in John chapter 20. And it is, it's, a, it's a message to all of us. It doesn't matter where he's had to lift us up from. It doesn't matter what sin he's had to conquer in our life and where he's had to free us. We now can carry the good news and we, we are trying it back to back to carry it around the world to kids who need hope, who have had the death of dreams and the death of hope and the loss of family. 
and we get to tell them this incredible news in Christ Jesus because of this holiest of weeks, because of the power he demonstrated on that cross and through that resurrection, you can dream about a life eternal with him. He can bring that life inside of you and untold storylines will come out of it, untold goodness, untold communion with him. And that's the message we feel privileged to share every day of the year with you. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we want to bring to kids from hard places, to vulnerable and orphaned children around the world. Thank you that this is the week we remember that it's all possible. May you and yours have a chance this week to sit in the truth of it all, to believe in the hope of it all, and to agree with Jesus, to be a part of stories of reconciliation and redemption. God bless.